We've heard many times in this uh, uh, forum about uh, you know how many people there are in the world. There are billions of us, and we're doing billions of downloads or of, and taking billions of photographs of ourselves and uploading them to the internet. And you know we're all so very important. But at least so far, there are other things on the planet that are in far greater numbers than ourselves. Hopefully, it'll stay that way because it's rather scary if that uh, should change. And so there are some projects which uh, our next speaker is going to talk about that are trying to give us a handle on those kinds of issues. And uh, the gentleman who's going to speak is uh, Javier de la Torre. Uh, he's uh, the founder of a company called Visuality in Spain. Uh, and uh, he's worked on a number of uh, these biodiversity projects. He's originally an agriculture engineer from the uh, Polytechnical University of Madrid. And uh, please uh, welcome Javier. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so I don't see so many people, so it's a little bit late, so great, because I'm a little bit nervous. But uh, okay, so we'll run already explain it. So I'm going to be talking today about biodiversity, why is this is important, and why the geospatial component of biodiversity is important. So yeah. first, I thought maybe it's interesting to introduce what, what biodiversity is for some people. So it's uh, the classical definition is the, is the result of four billion years of evolution in the Earth. So that's the kind of classical. And if you want to think of it more visual, it's kind of said, like, if you, if you get a place where there's a lot of species, then it's a place where you have a lot of biodiversity, okay? So, a part of this introduction, then, I want to go through what the things we're doing with biodiversity for a more kind of introduction. It's uh, probably most of you know uh, Natural History Museums. This one is the Natural History Museum in London. It's a very nice place. You've probably been there. And, uh, yeah, most people... Well, this one is the one in Paris. Most of the people have seen this, uh, this kind of exhibitions where you see very nice animals. It's very nice for the kids. It's very, very impressive. But what most of the people haven't seen is what is uh, behind these uh, museums. It's what we call the biological collections. So this one is from the Smithsonian Museum in, uh, here in the, well, in the States, sorry. So, um, and yeah, this is uh, um, f uh, research facilities for researchers doing uh, biodiversity studies. So what you, what you got in there is, uh, is the specimens that the uh, researchers have been collecting for a long time. So it's more than three. We have specimens from more than 300 years ago. So yeah, they got them in the field, and they put them here in boxes. So it's very important for, the, for taxonomy. There is uh, something very, very relevant for us. Um, because if, if someone finds a new species, they normally have to take one of the specimens, so they have to collect it and put it in a museum, and that becomes like the proof that there's a new species. So that's why, well, we have a lot of collections like this. So in one of these uh, boxes, this is from the, from the Natural History Museum in Madrid, uh, you can find something like this, uh, uh, a beetle. And uh, this one is uh, identified, the scientific name is called Osmoderma uh, eremita, and what it's normally the research is put together with the uh, specimen, that's the beetles, it's uh, the place where they founded it, in this case it's the uh, National Park Ordesa, and the, and the date when they founded it. Nowadays they also might put uh, coordinates and things like that, but basically at the end they put this information, it's uh, what, where, and when. So how this gets here, it's very, well, you're going to get a researcher going to the field, going with orange, uh, they love to go to very nice places. And um, yeah, well, they go collecting. So they go, for example, to, to the Pyrenees and, and there to the National Park or there some. And there they find this beetle, take it, put it in a, in a kind of a bottle or something, and bring it back to the museum. And, and they, they hosted it there. And as I said, there's specimens like this one. This one is around 150 years. The, the, the date actually is wrong, but it's here. It's, it's put it for another example. But it's, again, what it's basically saying is this specimen is uh, that this, uh, this species was at this uh, specific place at this particular moment. And these three things is what we call in biodiversity primary data. This is, uh, this is going to... We're going to evolve over it, but it's, uh, it's the most fundamental piece of, pieces of uh, information that we use for uh, studying biodiversity. So, well, what is happening nowadays is like people take this information, put it in a, on, a, on a map, put it in a database normally, 
and then produce a map. But if you get a point like this, you don't have much information. You cannot do much with it. What you normally do is you have a lot of uh, points of where you found this, uh, the same uh, species. No? So then you start having this kind of clouds of, of points. That's very useful because that's kind of give you an idea of where the species live. So that's what we call the, the range of the species, where, where can be found. Um, and yeah, and this information can be very interesting, for example, for uh, finding things like uh, where, where should I put a national park, a protected area? One thing you can do is put, put all, all those layers of those species together and say, well, if I want to protect something like 90% of uh, species in my country, where should I place the next national, uh, national park or protected area? That's very often is not the case that actually the protected areas are very, very well related to where biodiversity is. So that's one thing. So again, this is what uh, primary data is, uh, is about and, uh, and why it's so useful. But the thing is that to do this kind of analysis, we really need a lot of data. We need massive amount of data. If not, it's really, really very, not very valuable. If you have like three places where you have, a, you have found a species, you cannot do much with it. So uh, right now on the web, and I'm going to be talking later, as Ron said, about the, the projects that are working on, on it, but there's more than uh, 170 million records of this kind of primary data available to, to do studies. So that's the kind of uh, distribution. So, so we have some, quite some, and it might look like a very big number, but actually it is not. And I'm uh, going to put it in context together with something called biodiversity hotspots. So the idea of a biodiversity hotspot is places where there's a big concentration of biodiversity. So you normally find like a lot of endemies and things like that. And it's, uh, it's claimed that it's, they host something like 40% of the whole biodiversity in the whole planet within something like 15% of the, of the surface. So it's really, really critical places. So if, if you think um, on them and you correlate them with the data we have, the data that researchers have been collecting it, the term may be not very clear, but it's what we are actually looking at is that the, the data that we have on the biological collections and that we have already available on internet is actually very far away from the, from the, from the um, uh, biodiversity hotspot. So even if we have a lot of data, we probably don't have it on the correct places if we want to understand biodiversity as a whole. So the situation right now, we call it, it is, uh, what we know is about birds in Europe and in the United States. That's basically what we know. That's very, it's birds, something that the people love a lot. So we have a lot of information about them. People are really watching them. And that's what most of the data we have. So in fact, we actually have very little data. So you have to consider we, there is uh, an estimation that we have around from 2 to 10 uh, to 50 million as, as species on the, on the, on the Earth. And uh, known right now is around 1.8 million, and and yeah, and considering these numbers, there's a lot of species for which we don't know even a single primary data, even a single record. We don't know where they are, so it's really, really little. So one possible solution I want to introduce for uh, for discussion later, it's uh, what we call uh, needs modeling. So it's basically trying to mo model where species are by using, uh, for example, environmental layers. So you get like uh, you had the, the where the your points you get the environmental layers like summer precipitation, winter average height, things like that. Normally, this kind of uh, give uh, the, the the variables that really uh, influence if a species can live in a place or not. So what you do is quite simple: is you you model these things together. So you say, well, if it's in this place and it has these uh, these conditions, probably it's going to be on this other place that has the similar conditions. So with this, we create with uh, these um, potential distribution maps. So this is the potential where it could be. The whiter is the, it has a higher probability. So but then what you do is put actually a cutoff and you say, well, I'm not going to accept anything that it doesn't have a more a probability of higher than 80% or something like this. So this way you're actually gaining some some more information. So from the your original uh, range map, you're actually starting getting some more. Yeah, so that's one, one thing that we, we're trying to do for a lot, a lot of species where we don't have much data. But the same technique can be used for a lot of other things. And one is very relevant now is uh, it's for using it for projecting the data against different scenarios, like uh, global warming and things like that. So what you do is like if you know where it is right now, you just model it to you project your model against a different scenario like this one. And you can see, well, you can all imagine that the, the species are just moving all north due to the temperatures. So that's one of the potential of those models.